Hi, online students. We are alone together in the classroom because I thought that I recorded my live session with uh, my students earlier when they were in the room, um, but uh, I didn't apparently. I either erased it unexpectedly uh, when I was supposed to be saving it at the end or I never hit record to begin with. So it's just you and me, but we're in the classroom. So I've got, um, I've got the uh, board behind me with some of the stuff on it that we talked about in class when my students were here. And so you're gonna get the same stuff as they do, just maybe not the same benefit of the class discussion that we had today, um, in which I learned many different words in different languages for the word cat that we'll talk about here in just a second. I'll um, give you some of that information. But today is the start of the language chapter. So um, if you're keeping up with the schedule on the syllabus, uh, remember that I made an announcement a couple of weeks ago, I think it was in week six, I made an announcement that we were going to rearrange some of the um, chapters that we're focused on for, you know, before midterm happened, because I wanted to make sure and talk about the politics chapter or some of the information in the politics chapter when um, Super Tuesday was going on. So uh, I rearranged, made that rearrangement for that reason. And today, the beginning of week eight, we're gonna talk about language and culture and language and geography in particular. So language, I've got a definition for it on the board here. We'll talk about it in just a second. But language is, an, is a cultural identifier. So it goes along with all of the topics that we were discussing in chapter five. And as a matter of fact, as chapter six in the textbook, the textbook authors are making a clear connection between the content of chapter five on cultural identity and cultural markers like race and gender, ethnicity, and those kinds of things, religion, um, language is a significant cultural identifier, as I have marked over here. But we'll get to that. Let's just talk about, in general, what language is, okay? So language is a set of symbols. In a nutshell, you can think of it as that. It is a set of symbols, and those symbols are used to communicate. Now, um, in your textbook, there's a little bit of a longer definition than, than that, and it includes things like uh, language is full of, it has sounds that are included in it, and that is true. Languages have sounds that are incorporated with it, but the key component of that, the, the most basic um, word or the most basic concept that has to be included in a good definition of language is that it is a set of symbols. So language is a set of symbols, and it's important to remember what the word symbol means from anthropology class or what the word symbol means in sociology class. You probably got the same exact definition in both of those classes if you've had them. A symbol is anything meaningful that represents something else. Anything meaningful that represents something else. So those sounds, those words, those parts of culture that are used to communicate, all of those things are symbols. So for instance, in class earlier, I remember feeling this left finger of mine to see if I wore my wedding ring to class today. Sometimes I pick it up and stick it on, sometimes I don't. Today I don't have it on. But when you see someone with a ring on this finger of their left hand, that ring usually symbolizes a message different than just jewelry. It usually symbolizes their marital status, right? Um, I was watching a movie the other day where someone had lost her husband and she was kind of grieving the grieving process for a year or two after he died. She, she kept that ring on her finger and as the movie progressed and she was healing with her grief and moving on with her life, there was a scene in the movie where she felt that finger and played with that ring for just a second and then you saw her take that ring off, look at it for a minute, stick it on this finger of this hand. So when that ring is on this finger of this hand, does it symbolize something at all or does it symbolize um, something different? It, it definitely symbolizes something different. The entire scene of the movie was about that. We're not going to forget this person who meant so much to us, but we are going to move on and live our life um, with the kind of uh, behaviors that 
they would expect of us if they were gone. So he was, she was taking this off, sticking it here. The, the meaning changed quite a bit. And so in language, we have a set of symbols that are used to communicate messages. Those symbols quite often correspond to sounds or they can correspond to imagery like that ring or like a brand name on a car or on your sunglasses or whatever. These things communicate messages about us and they are significant cultural identifiers. Um, components of language, com components of the communication process are significant cultural identifiers. We'll talk about that some more. Okay. So, um, I've got some of my beautiful artwork on the board for you here. Um, sounds are part of language. In your textbook author's definition of language, the word sound appears. Um, I've omitted it from my definition, but not because it's not part of language. Simply because a sound is one of those symbols used to communicate. So, letters, the written letter, used to communicate words where letters are combined to have meaning attached to them, all of these things are examples of symbols used to communicate a message. So this little banner thing that I've tried to reproduce part of here, you might remember or if you've ever seen a, um, a kindergarten classroom, there's many different symbols and graphic images on kindergarten walls that are used to try to um, encourage the learning process with, with language and the symbols associated with language. So for instance, if there is a banner of the alphabet with the large A and the little a, the large B, the little b, large C, little c, on, all the way down, there is typically going to be an image like this apple to signify, to symbolize the A sound. What does an A sound like? Ah, apple. So when we hear that sound, ah, we should immediately associate that sound as a symbol that represents this A. Or vice versa. If we see this A, we should immediately know, or in our learning process, we learn that we that, that is a letter that represents A, ah, the A sound. It's a vowel, it's a special kind of letter. So we learn all of the different meaning associated with the tiny components of our communication process. So there are tiny components of the communication process, like little utterances, like sounds. But really, those sounds, we need to put them together for them to have meaning and for them to have any kind of cultural significance to us. So the word that we used in class today, the example that we came up with was the word cat. So cat, as a word, is a symbol. It's a symbol because this word cat represents something else. What's in your mind right now as far as what cat means? Now, if I describe to you the image of a cat in my mind, I'm probably going to describe my cat Pudgy that I think you all met at the beginning of the semester because he was in my lap purring too loud when I was trying to make a video from home. So I think about a tabby cat. I think about one who's a little bit fat, which is why we named him Pudgy. Even as a kitten, he was a little bit chunky. So anyway, I think of that guy when I, when I hear the word cat because he's mine. Maybe yours has longer hair. Maybe yours is one of those hairless varieties that we were talking about in class today. Someone said, oh, I think those are scary, those hairless varieties. Because the symbol that most of us in this culture think of, or, or the item, the, the thing that most of us in this culture think of, when we hear the word or see the word, see or hear the symbol cat, we typically think of the kind with fur. So, yeah, you know, we had somebody who was like, oh, I don't want to think about this image of a hairless cat because it's frightening to her. So it symbolized something because as a cultural identifier, typically we don't see very commonly those hairless varieties. Okay, 
So, um, sounds, letters, words, which are a combination of letters that represent different sounds, these words are arbitrarily attached to the things that they mean. Arbitrary means it's random. Arbitrary means there's no clear connection. And what I mean by a clear connection is a cat or a sha or a niko in Japanese or gato, and this is French and Japanese uh, Western symbols for the Japanese pronunciation and gato in Spanish. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, these different ways that we pronounce these words, the animal itself doesn't make a sound like that. Cat, sha, niko, gato. There isn't a sound that those animals make that's like this. There, these words don't look like the animal itself. Thank heavens, I'm not a very good artist, so if we had some kind of pictogram kind of language, I would not be able to communicate in writing very well, personally. But these don't look like the animal, they don't sound like the animal when you're pronouncing them, and so these are symbols that all of us agree based on the language that we learned in our enculturation process. All of us agree that these words represent what they mean. And we learn this and we share this culturally with others in our social group. And so that's one of the reasons why we say that language is a cultural identifier. Um, for instance, you can look it up, I think it's in my anthropology book, an old anthropology book that I've got, that it talks about um, the bubbles in beer. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. Uh, the bubbles in beer is what I was saying. So, um, And you can look this up on Google. I, there were many times in class today where we looked up different things on Google or we asked Siri uh, for help finding something. But um, I believe it's in Munich, which is in, southern, uh, in the southern part of Germany, where beer um, is almost like a religion um, in, in that area. There are so many different types of beers that there are words in the language. I don't know any of them. Perhaps you do. You can post them to the reaction paper discussion board if you, um, if you look them up. But there are so many different words in German that represent the different bubbles, the size, the, the, the duration of the bubbles, you know, whether it makes the nice uh, frothy head on the beer or whether it pops right away. Um, there's a lot of different words for, for um, bubbles. I want to say, for some reason, the number 65 is stuck in my head. That seems like an awful high number to me because in my culture, in my group, um, beer does have bubbles, but I've never thought in my mental symbolism of beer and bubbles themselves about the different characteristics of different kinds of bubbles to the extent to where we would have a different word that represented these different kinds of bubbles. Uh, you know, I, I just, it's not part of my cultural schema, but in Munich, where um, beer is a very, very important part of culture, um, apparently this is one of those things where you find multiple words to describe the tiny little detailed nuances of the different kinds of bubbles in beer. So, and there's other examples um, about uh, different kinds of words existing in culture that's not necessarily part of, uh, like for instance, snow and the different kinds of winter precipitation that can fall in the south. We maybe think of snow as like one type, but technically like out in Utah where it falls all the time, I've got some friends who live out there, they have a different kind of classification for wet snow or dry snow, skiable snow, all of these different kinds of modifiers that go with um, with snow, or what's the difference between sleet and freezing rain and um, hail and ice pellets and all of these different kinds of things that can fall as part of winter precipitation. And therefore, how common are those words or the meanings of each of those words, the distinction between all of those words or among all of those words, how um, clear is that for somebody who is born and reared in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, or any of the states in our region where we just really don't see that many varieties of winter precipitation in the course of our lifetime. We kind of all think of it as, you know, one or two different kinds, different varieties. So 
language is a significant cultural identifier. In other words, from winter precipitation to the bubbles that exist in beer to the random words that we agree are associated with particular items in our culture, um, language is a powerful set of symbols used to communicate, yes, but it's, it's perhaps more detailed communication that we need to look at when we talk about cultural identifiers than simply the forms of communication than perhaps we've learned about in sociology class or speech communication class. Those forms of communication that I'm talking about here or that I'm referring to here are verbal communication and nonverbal communication. Um, certainly in sociology classes when I teach them, when, when we teach them here at the college, there's a chapter on communication, of one-on-one -on -one communication and uh, verbal and nonverbal cues and how we respond to that. In speech communication and um, interpersonal communication class that we also offer here at this college, you talk a lot about the significance of words, their meaning, Meaning, their power and nonverbal communication also. Um, words, of course, are made up of letters that are made up of sounds or they're made up of images. So for instance, words can be spoken, so you hear those sounds, but words can be texted and words can be written. And in class today, we had kind of a short little discussion on whether texted needed to be a separate item on this list here, or whether texted is just kind of like a bullet point under written. And um, I think that we just, well, we definitely decided in class together that texted words are different than written words because of the formality or informality of the two. So for instance, um, Slang, excuse me, <clears throat> slang is a word that we talked about in class today. And texted language, the general consensus of the class was that texted language com is composed mostly of slang. They taught me um, some different kinds of texting uh, today that I don't know because uh, I don't use it typically in my communication style. It's not part of my cultural identifier for my age group, whereas it is for probably most of, most of you and the age group that you represent. But texting is definitely a verbal form of language, but the words are spelled very differently, or the words are technically what we call acronyms, for instance. Uh, so, uh, for instance, laugh out loud is a common one that even old people like me use regularly. Um, what are you doing, uh, for instance? These are perhaps words that are texted, but it represents a longer string of meaning, right? So it symbolizes a longer thing than just LOL. Some people will say LOL in their spoken language these days. Some people say OMG instead of the full phrase. I have a friend who says OM goodness because she doesn't say the OMG thing and she wants people to know if she says OMG that it means goodness on the end there. So um, language, it has a lot of meaning that can represent what our inner, inner attitudes and feelings are on an individual level, but it also can identify you as part of a specific cultural group. So um, signed language, we have someone in my face-to-face -face class who is deaf and has a language interpreter, a sign language interpreter who attends every single day. So we had a really good discussion that I'm sorry you're missing, but we had a really good discussion about sign language as a cultural identifier and sign language as being a form of verbal communication. Speaking people don't typically think of signed language as a form of verbal communication. Typically, I have people say that sign language is a form of nonverbal communication, but that is not the case. These letters that I have written here, or these letters that have different sounds, k, a, t, these letters that have different sounds, the sounds k, a, t, or cat together, written, a person who is using sign language, the signed symbol of cat, 
is a word that you are signing with your hands instead of writing with your hands, instead of pronouncing with your mouth. So sign language is a form of verbal communication, and all of these forms of verbal communication, all of these forms of verbal communication, including texted and including written, have nonverbal communication that goes with them. Yes, even texted and written has nonverbal communication that can go with it. So, for instance, I've got some forms of nonverbal communication on the board here. Expressions in general, whether it's a facial expression, a frown or a grimace or a smile, right? Your uh, other expressions like your body language, are you standing up straight? Are you looking someone in the eye? How is it that you, do you touch someone and what does that touch? Uh, communicate? Do you handshake? Do you elbow pump? Do you fist pump? How are you, you know, how are you greeting people these days? Uh, I heard a report on the news this morning, I believe it was the Surgeon General himself, talking about um, how a lot of people have stopped handshaking in this time of coronavirus and they're using like an elbow pump or a fist pump instead to try to not spread germs. And so there's a lot of meaning behind any kind of expression that you can make from sounds, um, utterances like just going hmm, like that is a is a form of nonverbal communication or body language like you're slumped over or maybe you have a sad look on your face this communicates a message um, hand expressions hand symbols what does it mean if I do this what does it mean if I do this what does it mean if I do this these different kinds of things that we do with our hands, and probably another one that you're thinking of that no, I'm not going to do in our YouTube video, but um, there's lots of hand expressions that we can make in order to communicate messages. Facial expressions, like we've already covered, all of these nonverbal forms of communication can overlap verbal forms of communication to enhance meaning or change meaning. Um, Tone of voice is a big one. Uh, in class earlier, we talked about how um, a parent can communicate very quickly to their child whether they're happy or unhappy with their child just by the way they say their name. Uh, maybe it's got an angry tone of voice or maybe you say their whole name, you know, first and, and uh, middle and last name and that communicates a message that I'm unhappy with you. But tone of voice is used in many more situations than that. It can completely change the spoken word altogether. And also these two things, we'll talk about how you can express tone of voice in written and text in just a second. But in the spoken language, um, for instance, the word shut up, I don't know if you'll see that word exactly in the dictionary, but typically we mean shut up as keep your mouth closed, don't talk anymore. And we can say that in an angry way and, you know, shut up and maybe you even see me wagging my finger at you as, as a form of expression that includes, you know, enhances the message about shut up, you know, that mean tone of voice, um, those words. And that the message there is keep your mouth shut. I'm, I'm happy with you. I'm frustrated with you. Any of those overlying messages that happen in that communication process. But I can completely change my tone of voice and I can say the same words and it completely changes the meaning. Like, for instance, I can say shut up. And that tone of voice of kind of disbelief uh, tone of voice over it that completely changes the message. I'm not telling you anymore to keep your mouth shut that I'm frustrated with you or I don't want to hear anymore. I'm telling you, I don't believe it. You've got to be kidding. You're pulling my leg. Any of these other kinds of messages that that change of tone of voice communicates. Um, how do you, I've, I've said a couple times, you can use tone of voice with written or texted language to emphasize meaning, how, what do you think I mean by that? How does that um, happen? Well, with uh, email, for instance, uh, with texting or email uh, in the written or the texted form, you can put something in all capital letters, put every word and every um, part of your sentence in all capital letters, and that tends to mean certain things. 
What kind of tone of voice would that represent if I was in all caps for everything? You typically learn in communication classes that that usually signifies that you're angry, that you're really putting not only emphasis on a particular word, but that it's angry emphasis, typically. Uh, you can put something in italics to emphasize it, to call attention to it. You can put something in boldface to call attention to it. And that way you can apply tone of voice. Now you are relying on a lot of cultural identity knowledge to overlap that tone of voice so that you can make sure that you understand where the person is coming from. So usually the familiarity that you have with a person um, will determine what, uh, how they interpret your tone of voice that you intentionally put into text messages or written messages. Um, in texting or in writing, you can also put expressions, and those are called emojis. And of course, you know um, many more emojis probably than I do. When you contact me, very often I'll use the thumbs up emoji. Very often I'll use the okay emoji, like I've understood you. There's many other emojis, the facial expressions. Uh, one thing that I sent to um, my husband recently, he said, do you want such and such for supper? And I sent the, an emoji that was like, bleh. <laughs> you know, it looked like that. And what was I telling him? I was telling him, uh, no, that sounds gross. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't particularly want to have that particular thing. So um, nonverbal communication is definitely part of what we're doing right now. My hand expressions signifying I'm transmitting information and you're going to be transmitting information to me in your reaction paper or in your texts. Um, so we exchange information verbally in speaking or in writing. But the nonverbal stuff is where a lot of the meat of understanding, a lot of the meat of communication takes place. Um, so language is about communication, and language is the set of symbols that's used to communicate. So because we have a very basic definition of language, and like I said, your textbook author has a little bit longer one and it includes the word sounds in there. But because we have this basic definition of language, all of these different forms of communication are included in it. And language is a significant cultural identifier. There is a word in your textbook that you will read about called dialect. A dialect is the way language is spoken and used. Perhaps your accent, your word choice, your syntax or the way that you string together sentences. These kinds of things can be a cultural identifier. On Thursday in class, we will talk a little bit more about this, and, but there are some maps in your textbook um, that talk about perceptual regions in the United States and where we say certain things. Like for instance, I have a friend um, from North Carolina and she uses the word Hoover when she means she's vacuuming her house. So, um, so I'll, you know, maybe a chore that I do on Saturday is I vacuum the living room. Well, if that was her chore that she does on Saturday, she would say, I have to Hoover the, the living room. Um, so this is a difference in that, that verb, Hoover, uh, which of course you and I maybe know that word, it's a brand name of a vacuum cleaner, but in North Carolina apparently um, they use it to mean the verb vacuum. We have similar things like that that we use here in the South. I've heard people talk about, um, I need a Kleenex. Well, Kleenex is a brand of facial tissue, just like Hoover is a brand of vacuum. And so, um, you know, we could have a Puffs, we could have a Kroger brand, we could have any kind of facial tissue, but we don't call it facial tissue, we tend to call it a Kleenex. And so these different kinds of things that are part of our culture um, can identify us as being from one region or the next within a country or, or across the world. Um, based on the kind of dialect that we speak. Um, you can see a few words that I've written on the board over here as cultural identifiers for, by region, by place or location. Um, 
y'all, you guys, and yous. I'm probably, I'm probably not even saying that correctly with the right pronunciation, but, um, and some of you maybe have um, other examples for the way you say you in, a, in um, a particular place. I had a student from California once, maybe some of you um, have ties to California, and I can't remember what she said that, um, that they use instead, similar to the word y'all, but not, not like any of these three on the board, if I remember correctly. But in other words, language can be a significant regional identifier also. You might think of the United States as one large culture that, that many, many different people in many different regions identify with. However, when we look within those geopolitical borders at the ways that people communicate in certain belts or you know, collections of states, for instance, those borders between states that maybe we can picture on a weather map are less clear when we look at, the, at language patterns and word choices. You can see in written and texted language also regional um, dialects. Uh, it's very interesting, the studies that are um, being done with texted or internet language in general. Uh, the most common language that's used on the internet, well, there's two uh, that tie for first with of the most common language that's used on the internet. That's English and Chinese, or for you and me, Mandarin Chinese is, um, is the variety of that dialect that uh, is very commonly used on the internet. And so when we look at those two language groups as being the dominant language groups that websites are published in, and you look at all of the variety of languages like Arabic and um, Farsi and all of the Indo-Asian um, and European languages, uh, there's a wide variety of spoken languages that are not represented in the written form that's used uh, on the internet for instance. And so you can read about some of these things in chapter six, which is what we're on right now. Okay, so that um, conversation about the internet having certain official languages, so to speak, um, brings us to the main part of the discussion that we had today in class, or a significant um, geography topic that we had today in class. And that is that language can be used as a weapon. That's something good for you to Google. Um, just Google a language as a weapon. And when I did that this morning before class, as I was prepping for this uh, lecture today, I found I don't know how many hundreds of hits of recent uh, media articles that have been published that have that exact phrase in the headline, uh, language as a weapon. There's many um, out there right now. One article that I read in particular was from Morocco. It was from uh, MoroccanJournal.com, or I can't remember exactly the name of the periodical, but Morocco is a tiny nation at the top of Africa that's really, really close to, to Spain. It's right where the, the uh, Mediterranean Sea, uh, that little strait where you can pass between Spain and Africa to get into the Mediterranean Sea. That's where Morocco is. And so this article was from the Moroccan Post or Moroccan Journal, and it talked about how language of colonial powers have affected the people's mindset and the people's uh, communication styles in Morocco. Now, Morocco is one of those places where over the centuries, over history, Spain and also France have been imperial powers colonial powers that have controlled the government and the governmental system in, in that area. So there are elements of language that's spoken, elements in the dialect, I'm looking at the board to see if I have the word dialect written up there, but elements of Spanish language, elements of French language in the spoken and written word in Morocco that are com were originally completely foreign to the area. But after centuries of occupation, after centuries of cultural influence from those two powers on that place, you have a lot of French and Spanish elements of language in that culture. This is an indication of how much power 
language has over cultural identity and how much power governments have over determining official languages in a, in a place and whether official language policies, here's a debatable topic that you could write about for a reaction paper this week, do official language policies, governments with official language policies, is that a tool of oppression of parts of it, the diversity of parts of its um, society, parts of the population in a place that don't necessarily speak the official language in their household as their first language? So you've heard of first languages, typically considered to be a native language of a person, or the language that an individual learns from, their, from birth in their enculturation process up to present. But their second language, sometimes individuals are, learn two languages simultaneously from birth until you know, whatever point in their life. But second language has kind of a dual meaning. Sometimes when we say second language, we're talking about learning another way of communicating after we learn our first one, so, so older than infancy. So if we start learning a second language family at six years old or at 10 years old or any time in, in adulthood, it can be considered a second language. But also, there is another meaning for the word second language, and that is that it is not, it is a language other than the official language that is either by law established by the government or simply by public consensus, the typical language that's expected in public. And so this is a way that language can identify us as the other or how we can identify with our own cultural group and identify against another cultural group. Um, official languages versus second languages uh, are interesting dynamics to look at worldwide. And there's a map in, um, in chapter six someplace about other languages other than English being spoken in homes, what percentage of children over the age five speak a language other than English within their household. Um, you'll, you'll find it on one of the first few pages of this chapter. But these second languages are a marker of cultural identity and also can uh, signify um, inequality in society. It can signify something that we have uncommon with, it's an uncommonality that we have maybe with mainstream society. Your textbook in chapter six, six opens with a, with a conversation about France, France the language and French the language. Um, France the country and French the language. So in France, um, there are a lot of immigrants just like we have here in the United States. In France, there are a lot of immigrants and the government has made French written and spoken French, particularly the written and spoken French in Paris and the surrounding area of Paris, that's the official language. So not just France and French being the official language, but the particular dialect of French at, that's written and spoken in and around the Paris area. So that's the official government language of that nation. France. However, the government has gone farther, and this is, um, you know, this has happened several decades ago, so this is not a new thing that I'm reporting to you, but the government in France took a step farther than that and announced that any company advertising in France to do business in France with French people, uh, ex you know, doing exchanges and participating in commerce with them, any business in France must use French and French only in its advertisements. And this became a major issue at the time this rule was imposed on businesses in France because it was easier to do in the official language of government. But let me show you some of the words that are non-French words that are very, very common words that had been used in advertisements 
Um, for instance, this word is an English word, hot dog. That word did not exist in French. That concept, that item, that food item did not exist in France, in the culture, and that wor a word for it did not exist in the French language. So le, L-E, is the word in French that means the. It's a masculine word in French um, that means the. And so in order to talk about a hot dog, to describe a hot dog in writing, in French, over the decades, le hot dog became a word that you would hear people talk about. Let's go get a hot dog. Um, or another word that I think your book mentions, weekend. This is an American concept that was not part of the dialect in and around Paris. It was not part of the French language in general. There was not a word for this concept. And so here's another one that became part of the French language, le weekend. So for instance, you might think about like a travel company or a restaurant company, any kind of thing in the hospitality industry that talks about weekend getaways and things like this that we're trying to, to sell, or what do you want to do uh, this weekend? How many times, uh, you know, I saw a Lowe's commercial this morning and it was talking about, you know, what's your weekend project and come to Lowe's and buy these plants that are in our nursery today. Those kinds of advertisements often use these concepts and there wasn't a French word for that. Um, so the French government imposed laws that would not allow companies to use these kinds of um, invasive words from other languages in their public advertisements. And so that presented quite a problem. School books, for instance, were not allowed to have words such as this in um, official publications. So language is um, a tool that can be used as a weapon to oppress different cultural groups, whether it's an official language versus a second language, or whether it's popular language versus official language. We have that hierarchical culture that has power to um, impose ways of life on people or has so much influence that it diffuses that hierarchical culture that starts maybe in an urban area, in a metropolitan area, diffuses outward because it's so strong and so influential. And so it kind of takes over. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. It can take over and modify the cultural landscape because of the, the power and the influence that it has. So um, look at this chapter. We will talk more about regionality of language and language as a cultural identifier. I might have time to show you a short video that I have in mind other than me in your video. I mean um, somebody else's video that I might have time to show you on Thursday. So read chapter six. The entire chapter six is your um, reading assignment this time, and we will have a quiz over chapter six topics on our, at our normal time this week. We're back to the normal routine after midterm is over. I'll have your midterm grades posted uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow is our deadline, so you'll see those on the portal tomorrow. And as usual, text me with questions and let me know what your thoughts and ideas are having to do with these topics. I'll see you soon.